I S U P K. Verse 18, it says that in the first month, on the 14th day of the month, at even you shall eat 11 bread until the 1 and 20th day. Mm -hmm. that, that part there, the 1 and 20th day. 21. Huh. 1 and 20th, please. All that, all that, one second. Mm -hmm. All that means, August, for seven days. Come. For seven days, you shall eat unleavened bread, which means every day you got to eat unleavened bread. Come. That's what it means. Every day, so from... From the next night after the Passover, every day you got to put some unleavened bread in your mouth and eat it. Right? What's the spirit of that law? Can you figure it out? Uh, uh, so I can say the, uh, the Passover. Why would the Most High want you to eat unleavened bread every day? Well, um, for a memorial so that we can remember. Remember what? That he uh, killed the first one of the Egyptians. Not for the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Well, I need to go over it then. I'll show it to you. Let's start with it. Where am I starting, my uh Feast of Unleavened Bread. Start, come on with me. Get down with me. Feast of Unleavened Bread. Tell me where I'm starting that in the Bible. Give me the law and then give me the event. Give me the law in Leviticus 23. I think the brother was just reading it, right? And then give me the event in the book of Exodus that we are um, memorializing, all right? Read that scripture again, Sharma. Wait, hold that. First, give me Leviticus 23. You're going to hold that one and give me Leviticus 23. Are we broadcasting solid in? Give me Leviticus 23, where the Most High commanded that the Feast of Unleavened Bread is a high holy day. Go ahead. Leviticus chapter 23, verse 6. Go ahead. And on the 15th day of the, of the same month. The 15th day, remember, the Passover is on the 14th day. Of the same month. Everybody's there. All right. The Passover is on the 14th day of the same month. On the 15th day, the day after the Passover. First of all, before I forget, get a most high, my most high hand for that Passover. Ooh, we we got it in on there. We got it in. I was in the, I was in General Johanna's office, brother, and I heard the camp crying out with the UPK song. It was calling me to war. I heard we want no cowards in our camp. Brother, I'm in the office, brother. I can feel it calling me out the room. I'm sitting in that back office like, oh my God. I wanted to get out there. I heard y'all singing that song. That song is in my blood. I heard it calling and ringing out. We want no cowards in the camp. My, I started to get up out the chair and walk out the room and go in there. It was an excellent Passover. Give the most high a hand. Outstanding. And the water to all the brothers and sisters that came from so far away, man. The water the brothers came from Hawaii, from Puerto Rico. Puerto Rico, we don't have. But Hebrew Academy. Found out about that, Puerto Rico. Right? We missed that one, right, Maya? I've been getting Found out from Aisha Parham about Puerto Rico. All right? Puerto Rico, the UK, who came from so far to the Hebrew Academy, from Hawaii. You know, those brothers and sisters, man, you proved yourself that day. You made the pilgrimage that is the Passover. And the Passover is such an important day for so many reasons. One, like Commander General Yohanna always taught, it's so important to remember that our God stood with us in, when we were in great travail and in great trouble and being greatly oppressed while we were a people small and few and with so few resources. The Most High stood with us 
and delivered us out of our captivity with a mighty hand that we could not have done on our own. Now, why is that important to remember? Because he will do it again. That's why the Lord never wants us to forget the Passover. And then every year, we all come together in Jerusalem, in the new Jerusalem, meaning in this captivity, which is where the truth started, which is in Harlem, New York, man, where the truth began in this captivity, just like your brothers of old made it down to that first Jerusalem, man. And just like we'll be all, we'll all be together again in the new Jerusalem, in the kingdom of heaven, man. And why is it important? Because the going to the Passover is a pilgrimage. You understand? It's a pilgrimage. It always was. What did Joseph say? Joseph said he went to Judea every year. Why? Because he was of the house and lineage of David. And he would travel down to Judea from Galilee, man, with no buses, no cars, on donkeys. He traveled down from, Gal from uh, G Galilee to Judea every year, man, to be in the city of David because he was of the house and lineage of David, man. And it was so important. And it's such a pilgrimage. And it proves you because literally you don't have a way to get there. You don't know how to get there. You can't make it there. The, the white man has, a show, has made it so you have the ability to do one thing and one thing only. And that's to get your black behind to work every day. And that's it. And that's all you have the strength to do. That's, you think the biggest excuse in the world is, I have to work. I have to work. Man, wouldn't it be amazing if you could work a slavery and serve the Lord? But instead, what does the white man want? The white man wants you to have just enough strength to get your shoes on every day, brush your teeth, and get out to work. And when it comes time to serve the Lord, you can't do it. Precept. In Exodus 1, Exodus the first chapter, where they said that, where Pharaoh said, you be idle. That's why you say, let us serve the Lord. Give me that in the book of Exodus, the first chapter. Mm -hmm. And that's why if you're somebody that did not go to the Passover this year, you can count your manhood cheap today if you did not go to the Passover. If you're sitting somewhere in some city, I heard it was brothers in some city, <laughs> whole camps of brothers that did not go to the Passover. You know why? Because they couldn't make it. Oh, no. Oh, poor brother. You couldn't make it. Why? Because I work from Monday to Friday. I only get one day off a week. Then I got to feed my dog and take care of my cat. And my wife, she needed me to go to her mama's house. Oh, brother, I would cry for you if, if, if I wasn't laughing at you so hard. I would cry. I would cry if I didn't think you were a joke for what you're saying. How do you come in the UPK and not take hold of this Holy Spirit? You're like a stone sitting in a stream. Water all over you, but no water in you. Water all over you. Water all around you, but no water in you. What's the point of being in the UPK if you don't ever take up the banner to do things that are impossible, especially when the impossible thing is a bus ride or a plane ride that somebody else pays for. Ain't that amazing? So that some a bus ride that when you call the school and say, I don't have enough money, Commandant General Johanna, in his benevolence, pays for you to come to the Passover. How many people out there know that people would call the school all month? And say, I can't, I can't make it there. General Yohanna would send somebody $300, $500 that he never met to come to the Passover. That he never met. And he sends it. Now you tell me what pastor or what reverend or what deacon or what imam or what elder is doing that. Tell me. None. So in essence, all you had to do was have enough strength to want to go to the Passover and to tell somebody you want to go. And then you get a damn, then, then all of a sudden, money gets transferred in your account. 
so you can make it to the Passover. If you in the UPK and you didn't go to the Passover and you're a man, count your manhood cheap today. Your manhood is not worth what it was yesterday. It's cheap. You had a, you had a pilgrimage to go on that you could not make. You, you're, you're cheap. Your manhood is cheap. Now, is that, is that the end of life? No, man. Life ain't over. You still here and you're still alive to be able to do better, to stand on your feet and be a man. But for you brothers that came to the Passover with no money, with no way to get back, I've seen that. What about Oklahoma one year, my y'all? Where's the office in Oklahoma? Oklahoma came to the Passover, brother, one year, sold his tools. He's a mechanic. He sold his tools, came to the Passover. Of course, didn't tell anybody he was selling his tools, my y'all. I can't mention that. He sold his tools, came to the Passover out with no way to get back to Oklahoma. None. You remember that, my y'all? No way to get back. What's his name? Ayash Kabawad. Now he's in charge of the Oklahoma school. He came to the Passover. He said, I sold my tools to get here, and I got no way to get back home. General Yohanna paid for his ticket to get back home and then gave him the money that, for his tools. Then gave him the money to buy his tools back. So what in the hell is your excuse for not going to the Passover? You are vagina. Women carry it. It's all over the place. It's good. But it's nothing you should worship. <laughs> Everybody understands that. You don't want to be it. You want to get it, but not be it. That's that's the that's the difficulty. Count your manhood cheap. But you brothers that made that pilgrimage, oh man, you did something. Brother came from Hawaii, eight hours on the plane, eight hours. Supervisors hounding him, but he got there and did it. Who else? All over Minnesota. Who else? I mean, everybody came from all over the damn globe, man. Got down there in New York and made that pilgrimage that Joseph made with his pregnant wife. Joseph made that pilgrimage with his pregnant wife to Judea. Come on. California came down from old sunny, wonderful California, came up to this hard, dirty city in New York, came up, stayed until Tuesday. Did what they had to do. Cal Who's the head of California camp? Godal, Officer Godal, man. Came up, stayed until Tuesday. Cal um, oh, what's the, uh, North Carolina came up, brought all their reds. General Shalomar, come on, man. Did I bring this out? General Shalomar paid for a floor of hotel rooms. A floor. We was in New York, brother, and the entire floor of hotel rooms was Israelites. I walked out in the hallway, brother, to get some ice. I walked back in. Because I walked out in the hallway. It looked like 10 lions were coming down the hallway with braids and beards and fringes swinging. I said, God damn, we're going to get kicked out of this hotel tonight. I just knew it. Because they were stomping up the hallway that hard, up that hallway, feeling like men. Joseph did it with a pregnant woman. He did it. Went to Judea. Wife gave birth on the way. Wife gave birth. They didn't even have any rooms in the inn. Joseph had to put his wife in a barn, in a barn, because there, were, there was no room for her in that hotel or in that inn. His wife gave birth in the dam in a, on, on hay where donkeys sleep at. Did he cry about it? Did he say, I can't go, my wife's pregnant. He brung that pregnant wife. He brung her. That's what Joseph did. And his son became the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings. And he brung his pregnant wife to Judea, brother. He brung her. Now you sit home somewhere in Kalamazoo or around the corner from the, from the Passover and you feel like you can't make it, count your manhood cheap. And you sisters, if you a sister in the UPK who does not have a man, and you did not come to that Passover, that's why you do not have a man. I'm telling you as clear as I can tell you, like a father out of love. The brothers had corsages where married women wore the red corsages to let all the brothers know, stay away from my wives. Make sure you know that. Don't come, don't look at them, don't act like you don't see them when they come to mind. <laughs> right now, after that, 
The unmarried woman wore white, of course. Am I right? White, my up? The unmarried woman wore white corsages so brothers could know, get it. Come get it. It's all clear and free. Have it attack. Come your shala, fall on her. And these sisters came and brothers, and their brothers got to see these single women, man. How you gonna be an unmarried goddamn woman and you didn't make that pilgrimage to the Passover? What is your problem? Do you love being sick and alone and miserable all your damn life? What if the brother wants a woman who can achieve something? Maybe he maybe he'll say, Well, this sister couldn't even get to the Passover. She can't do nothing for me. What's she gonna do for me? I need a capable woman. You and you know that a cop. The man in the UPK wants a woman of capability, otherwise known as what? Virtue. Virtue. A woman who has abilities. A woman who can say, well, I live in so-and-so, but I'm getting to the Passover. Especially when, if she calls someone and tells them she doesn't have the money, they'll pay for the broad to get to the goddamn Passover. Especially when somebody will send her money so she can come to the Passover. General Yahama paid for sisters to come to the Passover who don't have money while you say he hates women. While he pays for sisters to come to the Passover who are not his wife, who are women he does not know. But she was just a sister that was willing to make the pilgrimage, man. And she can count herself a virtuous woman. But if you are a woman who did not go to the Passover because I can't find a babysitter, Mary went to Jerusalem pregnant and due, due for the baby to be born. I don't know what your problem is. Have the baby at the Passover, why not? That's excellent. I had a rib, had the baby Passover night one year. Had the baby on the Passover, Passover night. I started to name the baby Passover, except for Christ being the Passover, I named the baby Zadok, because he was born at the Passover. Passover night, my rib got pregnant with one of my sons. And he was born, I named him Righteous because she had to leave the Passover and go to Harlem Hospital because Harlem Hospital was closer to the Passover. And she went and had the baby there at Harlem Hospital. And I named him Zadok. And he's around right day, rock, today rocking and rolling and getting it on. Give him a hand, Most High in Christ. Now here you are, you simple behind, what silly woman. You ain't come to the Passover because you ain't have no babysitter for them badass kids? Well, you will have a babysitter soon. It's called uh, foster care. You're gonna have somebody to watch that kid very soon. Foster care is gonna watch your kids. And the parole officer will watch your kids. And the CO will watch your kids. And the police will watch your children because you did not bring them to the Passover. So don't you wanna show your sons some hardcore men so he can know that when he's on the street corner with Rashi and them, those men are not hardcore. He'll come into the Passover and see real gangsters in the Passover. Real gangsters. Real men who will kill or die for their brother. Now, you think Rashi can say the same thing? You think Chief Keith can say the same thing? Well, but if your son doesn't know these men, he'll look at Chief Keith and think Chief Keith is hard until Chief Keith snitches on him and puts him in jail, then he'll wishes he was there with Mayak that day at the Passover, with Saka War that day, with Nayathak that day at the Passover. Woman, you you can you proved yourself that you are not virtuous by not coming to the Passover. Everybody understands that. But for all of you people that did, the Lord is highly impressed with you and give yourselves a hand. Most I impressed. Uh, I wasn't there, but you know, I, I, you sick. I got my mm -hmm. But um, I was there in fifth grade. I got like a thousand pictures of my phone. Yeah, this brother, he was unclean. He couldn't come to the Passover. If you're unclean, that's totally different. Some sisters were unclean. You couldn't come. That's the most high not wanting you to go. The most high held you back this year. If you a sister who was on our monthly or you just had a baby, the most high kept you from the Passover. That's not your fault. You know that. But you are rare. I'm talking about the people who were clean, who could come, but didn't because they're weak. You understand? And this society breeds weak black people. And they take them and fill up jails with them so that they can make goods for America. 
so they can work in the prison harder than they ever worked outside of the prison. But if you work outside of jail, you'll be able to not work in the jail. You get that, don't you? Work outside of the prison. Work hard for your nation. Work hard to build up your nation. And you won't have to now work twice as hard in there to make license plates and make uniforms and make this and make that. Some of these prisons have you working in McDonald's in the jail. When you go to work every day in a McDonald's, go home at night to your prison cell, go home. You work every day in a telemarketing firm, go home at night to your prison cell. Why don't you work hard in this nation and not have to do that? That's the Passover. Everybody gets that. You want to read me any questions online? You have any? Solid. Uh, Maya, come here for a second, quickly. No, no, who's this coming up here? Uh, Akai, come here for a second. Um, now let's go to the scriptures. We're going to go over the Feast of Unleavened Bread. The Feast of Unleavened Bread is what we're in right now. It's the day after the Passover. Read me the long Leviticus 20. The Feast of Unleavened Bread, Leviticus 23. Let's have it, General Maya. No, in Leviticus 23, first. Leviticus 23rd chapter and the, and the sixth verse. And the 15th day of the same month is the feast of unleavened bread unto the Lord. Seven days ye must eat unleavened bread. In the first day ye shall have a holy convocation. So here's the law. Feast of unleavened bread. Nice and loud. Mike, you mind coming up so they can hear you just in case? Seven days, you, or you can give it to a card, either one. Seven days must you eat unleavened bread. Okay, what does that mean? For seven days, you must eat unleavened bread. What is unleavened bread? Flat bread. Bread that is void of uh, baking soda, baking powder, yeast. That's unleavened bread. Leaven is what rises bread. That's what leaven is. It's the old term for yeast. All right. What is leaven? You get a loaf of bread. You see how light bread is? Soft. That's the bread is light and soft because it contains leaven. You get a biscuit, right? You see a biscuit? A biscuit is nice and light, chewy, tastes good. The reason it's so light is because of leaven. Now, for seven days, the Lord said you must eat unleavened bread. So what does that mean? It means it's bread that's hard, tight, flat, you know, rough. You must eat that for seven days. So every day for seven days, you eat unleavened bread. Let me give you some examples. Come on. Um, on, on that unleavened bread, say, for seven days, we eat uh, like a, like I have some of the free so I, I eat mine in the morning with breakfast. Seven days, do you think? Because we have to eat it at night too? No, you eat it when you're hungry, like you do actual bread that's leavened. When you're hungry. When you're hungry, you go to eat bread, right? Except this time when you're hungry, you're going to eat unleavened bread. And you're going to do it for seven days. Everybody's with me. All right? Seven days you must eat it. What is unleavened bread? General Mayak's wife is going to be putting a video out. Right, Mayak, or no? General Mayak's wife will be putting a video out showing sisters how to make it. It's simple as it could be. It's a, it, In essence, it's flour and water combined. That's unleavened bread. Now, after that, you can flavor it up with olive oil, with eggs, with honey, with sugar. But unleavened bread is flour and water combined. Match it up, flatten it up, cook it. That's unleavened bread, all right? Past that, you can flavor it with different things you want. Salt, you can flavor it, but unleavened bread is in its, in its normalist stage or basic stage is flour and water. Why? Because what is bread? Bread is flour, water, and yeast. That's bread. Flour, water, and yeast. So what is unleavened bread? Flour and water, all right? And General Mayak will give you a recipe for unleavened bread that tastes good. So you can have it taste good for those seven days. Taste good or not, you got to eat it for seven days, all right? 
Seven days you must eat unleavened bread. Don't know my eye. Keep reading. Seven verse in the first day, you shall have a holy convocation. You shall do no self servile work therein, but you shall offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord. The first day is a Sabbath. It's a day of rest, and it's a holy gathering where we come together in the temple to meet and go over the Sabbath service. All right, that happened already. That was the day after the Passover. In every city, in every camp, you should have had a holy convocation in your city the day after the Passover. Everybody's with me. No. Keep going. But you shall offer an offering made by fire to the Lord seven days. That's the sacrifice that we make now in spirit and not with a physical actual lamb. Keep going. And the seventh day is an holy convocation. You shall do no servile work therein. And then at the last day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, on the seventh day, there's another holy convocation, which is what? This Saturday, Maya? Or this Sunday? This Sunday is another holy convocation. This Sunday at sundown, you want to meet, eat, and there you can break the Feast of Unleavened Bread. So at that holy convocation, you go back to eating actual light bread. What's that bread you love? Stroman. Is that right? Stroman? Nature's choice. That's the good stuff. Whatever kind of bread you like to eat, or if you bake bread, bake it. Some of you sisters should learn how to bake some damn bread, man. Stop being so useless to a man. That's the problem with women, man. You're so goddamn useless to a man, and you wonder why he sees no need in having you. Because you're absolutely useless. What can he do with you? He can barely have sex with you. You can barely cook up some goddamn bread. Barely do anything for the brother. Make yourself of some use. Learn how to bake bread. Learn how to bake some unleavened bread during the Feast of Unleavened Bread. All right, keep going. I'm sorry. Go ahead, brother. Nice and loud, please. Okay, number eight. But you shall offer an offering made by fire. Okay. That is the sacrifices that we would make in the Lord before Christ became our last living sacrifice. You understand? That's a sacrifice made by fire. That's when we would kill a lamb and burn it up to the Lord. Now, the sacrifice is you. Christ died, so the Lord has no, no pleasure in sacrifice. That's in the book of Psalms 51. With the most high, the sacrifice of the Lord is a broken and contrite heart. That's what he wants. I I, for, I for I delighted not in the blood of bullocks, else will I require of thee. I delighted not in the blood of lambs, but the sacrifice of the most high is a broken and contrite heart. So now we know the Lord doesn't want us to kill bulls and to kill lambs and give them to him, burn them up for him. What the Lord wants is your spirit, is your heart to him. So now you keep the feast and you keep the Passover, but you do not give the Lord a bull. You do not give him a lamb. You get the point. All right. Uh, Bobbity bang, Bobbity bang. Read whoever was reading. Come on, come. We have here on book of Leviticus 23, verse 9. And the most I speak unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel. And say unto them, When ye be come into the land which I give unto you, and shall reap the harvest, the harvest thereof, then ye shall bring a sheep of the first. You can fruit. stop right there. No, now, no, no. I'm now give me in Exodus. Give me the scripture that the Most High wants us to remember. The reason that we have the feast of unleavened bread. You give me that in the book of Exodus. We're going to go back to a time when we left out of Egypt. You find that a kind? I mean, um, I might also, Sharma, oh, find that for me, all right? I believe you had it next to this already. Let me set you up. To, let me tell you where you are, all right? This is where you are. The Israelites were in Egypt. Moses told Pharaoh to let his people go to serve the Lord three days in the wilderness. That's all we wanted. All we wanted was three days off. Pharaoh said no. Pharaoh said, you wouldn't even have asked for three days off if you were working hard enough. Pharaoh gave us more work to do so we could do work for him and forget about our God. 
That's why we have slavery today. That's why you think that because I got to go to work, I have a job. That's why you think that's an excuse to miss the Passover when that's more reason to make the Passover. That's more reason to do it because you have to act like a slave all year, all day. And this is the one day where you're going to go serve the most high and you have a year to prepare for it. Well, Pharaoh said, I'm going to give you more burden so you can forget your holidays. So you can forget your high holy days, which is all Moses wanted. Three days for us to have a holiday or a high holy day. That's it. Pharaoh said, no, gave us more work. Then the Lord said, that's it. Let my people go. Pharaoh refused. The Lord began to curse the Egyptians. Ooh, we plagues of mice and locusts and the water turned to blood. Everything was horrible in Egypt and it was glorious. And at the end of it, Pharaoh still said no. And the Lord killed the firstborn of every Egyptian son. Every Egyptian son, whether it was a beast or an animal or a slave or Pharaoh's son. Every Egyptian firstborn son died, Passover night. That night we were in Harlem, in that ballroom, outside the door while we were singing, we want no cowards in our camp. The Egyptians were dying outside the door, dying, screaming about their children who they went to their room to shake them and they wouldn't wake up. That's what happened Passover night. At the end of the morning, the Lord said, Get ready to go quickly in the morning. Because once these Egyptians wake up and find their sons dead, they are going to thrust you out of Egypt. Thrust means what? Kick you out. They're going to push you out, officer. Um, right. Like when you said every firstborn, okay, would that be like grandfather, firstborn? Eldest son. Okay, this is so good. Eldest son. So if you have five children and your daughter is the oldest, your oldest son died past overnight unless you were in a room selling, celebrating it with the Israelites that night. All of the Egyptians who did not have the blood of a lamb over their door, which meant they were not obedient to Moses. Moses gave the nation an order to go into their house, to not come out. But to kill a lamb, put the blood over the door, and eat that lamb in that house made uh, cooked with fire. If you did not obey Moses that night, you woke up and your son was dead. Right. The Bible says there was not one house with at least not one with at least one dead person in it. So every house in Egypt had at least one dead person in it. And when I say person, don't get it twisted. The first male cow died. The first male mouse died. The first male chicken rooster died. The first male cat died. Every first male everything died. Unless they were under that roof with people who obeyed the word of God from a man of God. You understand? All right? So here comes the next morning. The next morning gets here. You can imagine how the Egyptians were, right? Mad as hell, scared to death. They said, go, go, get out, leave. They pushed us out, which is where I want to start right now. All right, come up front. Come up front, please. I'll just read. Is the door locked? Lock the door. Lock that door and then come up front. You got questions? Lock it, sir. I got a description. Go ahead. Exodus uh, chapter 12 and verse 31. Mm -hmm. And he called for Moses and Aaron by night and said, rise up and get you forth from among my people. So he called. So this is Pharaoh. Pharaoh called for Moses. Pharaoh went in there to see his son, the heir to his throne. And his son was dead. That little heathen, that little African was dead with that bald head and everything dead. And he called for Moses and Aaron. And he said, what? Nice and loud. Sorry, mouth. Come on, brother. Read it like you had can. Put your chin up. Put your chin up. Look at me. Sit up straight in your chair. Sit back. Like a can. Give it up to me. 
Come on. Exodus chapter 12 and verse 31. And he called for Moses and Aaron by night. He said, rise up and get you forth from among my people. That's what Pharaoh said. Get out from among my people. Right, right now, the Most High wants to keep you here. He wants you so bad, he can't even stand the fact that you live in your own house. He needs you in jail. <clears throat> he can't even stand the fact that you get to go home at night. He wants you in prison so he can have you all day, all night. That's how bad he wants you in America. He can't even stand the fact that you go home to your own house. He needs you in jail with him, watching over you all night. Pharaoh was the same way until his son was dead, and he wanted you out from amongst his people. Keep going. Can I don't come, sir? Both ye and the children of Israel, and go serve the Most High, as ye have said. That's all we wanted, but he wouldn't go for it. He said, you and the children of Israel, you leave and go serve your God like you said. Now you can go. Now I'm willing to listen. Go out in the wilderness and serve your God. Don't you see the trouble that the Most High went through to give us the Passover, man? All the people he killed. You better get there every year. You better make the pilgrimage every year to that Passover. Do it pregnant. Do it. Do it with your wife pregnant. Do it on a broken leg. Do it. Get there. Show the Most High that you honor your life, which he saved that night, so he can save it again. So he can save it again. Keep going. Can I know concert? Verse 32. Also, take your flocks and your herd, as he has said, and be gone and bless me also. He said, take your flocks, your herds, and bless me. Meaning, when you leave, I'm going to be blessed because you're gone. I'm going to be blessed because you've taken you, your flocks, and your herds. Meaning what? Pharaoh wasn't even trying to keep your goods. Take it all. Take your flocks. Take your sheep. Take your cows. Take everything and get the hell out of Egypt. And we did. We took it all. Took our flocks, our sheep, our herds, and got the hell out. Keep going. Kind of no concept. Verse 33. Let Amaya reach you the man the phone. Man the computer. Amaya, you got it. Tell me if we have any questions, Doc, all right? And if I can hear them, I want to hear them so I can see what spirit they in. Keep going. Come on, come on. We have the own book of Exodus 12, verse 33. And the Egyptians were urgent upon the people that they might send them out of the land in haste. This is the part you need for the Feast of Unleavened Bread. The Egyptians were urgent amongst the people, meaning they were not patient. They were saying, y'all leave, y'all. Come on, go, go. Take your sheep. Take your cows. Go. They were pushing us out of Egypt. Before, they didn't want us to go. But when their kids died, they were pushing us out of Egypt. Keep going. Come on, come on. But they said, we be all dead men. They said, if we, if we keep you here, we'll all be dead men. And that's what America needs, man. America needs to feel like if we don't treat these Israelites better, we're all going to die. If we, don't, if we don't give them what they want. Right now, you fighting and marching for the white man to give you $15 an hour minimum wage. And you marching and going nuts and voting for old stupid Bernie Sanders, and he's losing to Hillary Clinton. And you marching and trying and marching just to get a living wage to be able to support your family. Well, how much would the white man give you what you want if the one true living God of Israel killed his children? He said, you can have all the money you want. $15 an hour, take $50 an hour. Take the bank. Take it all. Do whatever you want. Take seven states and all of the goods and the resources. Take Fort Knox and, and Kentucky. Take it all so I can keep my sons alive. The problem is the white man doesn't respect black people. Because of our sin, he hasn't been forced to respect blacks and Hispanics. But once we serve our true living God, brother, he will be forced to respect us. You won't need to protest for no $15 an hour minimum wage. You won't need to do anything but take everything he gives you to stay alive. Because he'll want to live and not die. 
and he will give you, he will empty out Fort Knox to save his children. Keep reading, Sean Mark. I don't know, cuss, sir. And the Egyptians were urgent upon the people that they might send them out of the land in haste. Keep going. For they said, we be all dead men. 34, and the people took their dough before it was leavened. Their needy trucks being bound up. Now here we go. This is the part you need right here. Remember, the Egyptians are pushing us out of Egypt. Right? The Israelites are having to leave quicker than they anticipated. Read that last part one more time. And the Egyptians were urgent upon the people that they might send them out of the land in haste. For they said, we be all dead men. Keep going. And the people took their dough before it was leavened. And the people took their dough before it was leavened. Let the trooper grab it out. He can grab it. He's a trooper. Let him get it. You can get it out. Tell him where you are. Exodus chapter 12 and verse 34. And the people took their bread before it was leavened. Well, Moses told the people the night before that we'd be leaving early in the morning because the Egyptians were going to be so mad. But the Egyptians pushed us out so quickly that we had to take our dough before it was leavened. Why do I bring this up? Because if you know how to bake bread, you'll understand what this meant, means. I know how to bake bread, so I'll explain it to you. If you ever want, if you're high enough rank, I'll bake you some bread and it's delicious. I mod, ooh wee, it's outstanding. I can bake bread. I don't tell many people that, but I'm telling you today, I mod, because you deserve some good baked bread if you want some. Everybody understand? This is how you bake bread. You take flour and water, Right? And yeast. Yeast is old flour and water. Let's say I just combine flour and water in this cup and I set it down right here for about 14 days. Bacteria will form in that flour and water that will raise bread. You understand? It's bacteria, it's from the air. But you start with flour and water, but you need to let it sit out for about 14 days. Don't refrigerate it. Don't salt it. Just let it go rotten. Right. After it goes rotten, about seven days later, it will form a bacteria that is called yeast. Now you take this, combine it with flour and water, and it will raise your bread. Now the problem is it takes about 12 hours right. for yeast to raise bread. It takes 12 hours, right? The Egyptians kicked us out so fast that there was no time to raise our bread. You understand? There was no time. We had to leave so fast. It takes 12 hours to raise it. Keep going. Caught on my card. Verse on 34. And the people took their dough. Salakia. And the people took their dough before it was leavened. The needy. people took their dough before it was leavened. This is the next part I have to explain to you. Keep going. God, I'm God. Their needy trials being bound up and their clothes upon their shoulders. This is what you need. Their needing trials being bound up upon upon what um, I'm on? upon their shoulders. Upon their shoulders. This is what a needing trial is. A needing trial is imagine a table that is curved. A curved table, right? Be with me on this. A table that has a curve in it, that's a kneading trowel. Now, what, what is a kneading trowel for? When you knead bread, right? Kneading bread is working the bread. So I get flour and water, I put some yeast in it. I need to incorporate that yeast into the bread by kneading it. It's, it's like massaging it, turning it, hitting it. Why? Because when I, when I massage the bread, I create elastic in the bread. I create structure for the bread to rise. Right. Yeast goes in the bread, and yeast is a bacteria that bubbles. Those bubbles are, are carbon dioxide that breathe. So it breathes. The problem is, if I don't knead the dough, if I don't make the dough tough, when it breathes, 
the dough can't hold the shape. So I need to work the dough, work it, rub it up, rub it, rub it, work it in the kneading trough so that when the, when the dough breathes because of the bacteria, the dough is strong enough to hold the shape, which is how bread rises, all right? Now, but our kneading trowels were packed on our shoulders. We packed them already. So we had no way to knead the dough. And without kneading the dough, it does not hold a structure enough to rise. So even though it's yeast in it, without kneading it, it cannot rise, so it stays flat. Who does not understand what I'm saying? I don't believe anybody knows what the hell I'm talking about. Sis, do you understand what I'm talking about? Tell me if you don't. How about you, uh, 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 Sharma? No concept. Does anybody online not understand what I'm saying? I'm explaining baking to you right now. This is baking. Baking, this is how it's done. You need that thing so you can turn the dough move the dough, work the dough, so that when the bacteria activates in the dough, it can hold the shape. Come on. So I'm having a little issue with that. Um, work, working that you know how to do it, I'm Yeah, cut off my cut. Relieve the brother real fast. Relieve it. You got it. Please, uh, Charm off, give me, give me, help me up right here, please. Go ahead. Oh, that's like oh, my grandma when she would make the bread, when she would make her homemade biscuits and, uh -huh. and bread. Mm -hmm. She would she would beat it up on those. That's and what it is. You got to roll it. You got to beat it up, roll it, or else it won't rise. Mm -hmm. So now we had to leave Egypt in such a hurry that we the, the, the tables that we would use to knead the dough, to beat it up, were already packed. So we couldn't beat it up which meant the bread would not rise. Who can read for me? Go ahead. Any questions online, let me know. I got it, sir. Go ahead. Scott, I want to come. We had the book of Exodus 12, verse 35. And the children of Israel did accordingly to the word of Moses. And they borrow of the Egyptians jewels of silver. No, wait, wait. Skip me back up to the packed away thing. Cut on my card. Verse 34. And the people took their dough before it was leavened. So, and so the bread was not leavened. It was not rise yet because we never got a chance to beat it on the beat on the kneading troughs. Give me this one with soda. Give me the give me the other one, just strong. All right, go ahead. Cut on my card. They're kneading trials being bound up in their clothes upon their shoulders. So we packed the night before. Our kneading trowel, our clothing, our goods was already packed, so we did not need the dough. And because we didn't need the dough, all we had for that trip was what, sister? The unleavened bread, flat bread. That's all we had. So because that's all we had to eat, what do you think it was like three days after eating nothing but unleavened bread? Five days after eating only unleavened bread. How do you think the Israelites felt, sister? They wanted something else. You better believe it. They wanted something else. Give me, give me in the scriptures where the Lord, where we said, let us go back to Egypt, where we had the flesh pots. And where we had the garlic and the leeks and the onions to water. After eating that unleavened bread and that's all, we got tired of eating unleavened bread. Sick of it. You understand? Sick of it which is what the Most High wants you to remember. That's why he wants you to do it every year. Because out there in that wilderness, with only flat bread to eat, not that old light Stroman you make your old turkey and cheese sandwiches with, Caught but up. just hard, hard, rough bread. Not biscuits, but hard, rough bread. A few days of that, you're sick of eating it. You, if you, you are sick of eating unleavened bread right about today. <laughs> right about today, you like, man, I am tired of eating this flat, hard bread. That's the point. You understand? We think that. so much of learning is about, you know, placating to who you are and what you like. When education is about conforming you to what the Most High likes, you change for him. The Lord wants you to remember what it was like to eat something 
you did not want to eat for the sake of freedom. God, you understand? God. And right now, tons of people, ask, they say, well, if the white man gave us, you know, the, the state of Texas to live in, he left us alone. We go out there and do what? What do black people think? We go out in Texas and do what, sis? We go out and act up. That's what everybody says. Well, if the white man gave us Texas, Dave Chappelle did a whole comedy about it, about the white man giving us a few states. All we did, he gave us reparations in the comedy sketch. And all we did is go buy truckloads of uh, Newports and weed and cocaine and liquor and spent up all of our reparation money. And every black person has heard that joke like, man, we can't take care of ourselves. If you give us three states, to, three states of our own, we'll shoot each other, kill each other, and get high. Everybody has heard about that story, right? That joke, that. right? Well, that. that joke is true, except for people who have been trained for freedom. You understand? You got to be trained to be free. You got to be trained. If you're free, first of all, if the white man left us alone and gave us the state of Texas, you wouldn't be able to get cocaine. So what would you do? You'd have to be a man that is not addicted to cocaine. You'd have to be a man that is not addicted to marijuana. I don't know where you're going to get your Oxycontin from without the white man. Where are you going to get your pills from? Your V's and your volume and your syrup and, and all those things. You couldn't get those without the white man. You couldn't get all of the things that he gives you to keep you high. So you have to become first a person with no addictions. None. Step one. Then also, you couldn't go to McDonald's, KFC. Give me some more. Wendy's. Wendy's. You wouldn't have that either. You'd have to be a man that could eat <coughs> rations. You know what I mean when I say rations? That could eat whatever we have to eat to survive until we make a better life for ourselves. And that's what unleavened bread was. We didn't have any time to make that bread soft and delicious like mama's biscuits. We had to, we had to pack that bread up and go. So that bread was hard. And that's the bread we had. Now, will that make you want to stay a slave? It will unless you've been trained to do it. Every year, we as a people train ourselves to live with rations, to live on what we have. What else do we do as, a, as the nation of Israel that trains you to be free? What other high holy day? I might. Yeah, on day of, um, the talk. day of atonement. Yom, yom Kippurim. Yom Kippurim. The day of atonement. What do we eat on the day of atonement? Do you know, young man? What do we eat on the day of atonement? Trooper in the back. If you don't know, don't sweat it. Pe uh, people online, what do we eat on the day of atonement? I know you know, officer. What do we eat on the day of atonement? Do you know, sis? You've been the you've been the truth a year. This brother got some strong sons looking up in there. Oh, these, this brother brought some sons look like killers in this room. They some hardcore brothers you brought here tonight. They about three years old. Look like they killed three people already. Hang on. I know you. I know the officer. I know you know already. If you're an officer, I'm trying to give someone else a chance. In a second, I'm gonna give it to you. Nothing I might. Sharma. What do we eat on the Day of Atonement? It's a lot. Yeah, one, yeah. one second. Go ahead. Yo, yeah, brother um, online said nothing. We eat affliction on the Day of Atonement God and God. suffering. The Day of Atonement is a 24-hour fast. No food. No water. Your feast is affliction. Your feast yeah. is suffering on the Day of Atonement. That's what you eat on the Day of Atonement. You train yourself to eat and drink nothing on the Day of Atonement. This is a people training to be free, training to go without. And we do it every year. And before you know it, it will become commonplace. Before you know it, you'll do two days, three days when you feel it's necessary. You'll be able to do it. 
you'll know how to do it. So don't tell me that black people won't be able to survive without the white man. Black people in the world won't be able to survive without the white man. The UPK can do it today, can do it right now, can survive without him right now, tonight, if the Lord shows us mercy. We don't need him now because we don't need his marijuana. We don't need his Oxycontin, his pills. We don't need his drugs. We don't need his food. We don't need his water. We trained ourselves to suffer until we can make a better nation for ourselves. Everyone understands that. Now that well, that's the feast of unleavened bread. You're gonna remember what it was like to eat that hard bread. Eat some tonight. Have some in class every night, I might. So you can go, uh, we see even some in the refrigerator back there too, Sharma. Some unleavened bread. Eat some every day. Bite it. Oh, it's tough and it's hard. Mm. Eat it. Eat it good. Also, so you can understand too, what else is unleavened bread? Corn tortillas. Some of you, you have no ability to cook. I don't know why you wouldn't, but if you don't, corn, maybe you live in a shelter or something like that. <coughs> corn tortillas are unleavened bread. Is that unleavened bread? Break it out. Eat it up. Pass it around. Go ahead. What day, what day is there That's right now, tonight. Okay. It's it's seven days starting the day after the Passover. So say again. The day of atonement. The day of atonement is every year in the winter months. You can look up. General Mayak will give you the calendar soon. He'll post it on the internet. Come on. Oh, is, our, is it? Is, this, is this, this year or last year? This on. This on this year. This, this is current. Okay, Charlotte. The Day of Atonement is on October 10th. October 10th of this year. Sundown, October 10th. No food, no water. Now, just so you know, that is not for children or pregnant women or elderly sick people. They don't do it, all right? You feed these kids on, on October 10th. You understand? Feed them. You got children, you feed your children. They don't need to keep the Day of Atonement. You keep it for them. Heat up all of it. Heat up all of it and just give everybody a piece if you don't have a lot, all right? Um, children do not do it. When I say children, what do I mean? You got to be a man or a woman. So if you're a boy about 15, 14, when you're a man, you'll know it when you become a man. Your mother will know it. Your father will know it. When this boy ain't a boy anymore. And it happens around 15 years old. All right? That boy does the Day of Atonement. That girl, when she becomes a woman, you'll know it because her body will show she's a woman. Her spirit will show she's a woman. It's about 15, 16 around there. She'll be a woman. She'll do the Day of Atonement also. You got a little baby, feed him. Every day. Give them water every day. Heat it up. Is it hot already? Heat it all up. Pass it to the class first. Go ahead. Heat them all up at once. Sock. Not, not all in one plate at a time. Put all the bread on one plate. Heat all up at one time. Then divvy it out. Go ahead. The Day of Atonement? Yes. The Day of Atonement is in Leviticus, the 23rd chapter. All right? You find it right there in Leviticus 23. Keep going up. Come on, come on. We had the on book of Exodus. I think I'm done here with the day with that. Come on, okay, come on. I'm good with that. Now, where do I need to go from here? Go so ahead. He said the old flesh pots. The flesh pots. Let me show you where what happens when you are not trained to fast, not trained to eat something you don't want to eat every day. Keep going. Come on, come on. Exodus. So I, I missed something. I missed one thing. Come on, come on. Go back to Leviticus 23, where it says. You shall eat unleavened bread seven days. Give me the rest. Where it says no leaven shall be found in your house or in your dwelling. And, no, and you shall eat no leaven for seven days. And give me the questions online. Cut on my cut. I might. So like the first one you need, that's Exodus 13 and 3. Mm -hmm. Cut on my cut. Exodus 13 and 3. And Moses said unto the people, Remember this day in which ye came out from Egypt, out of the house of bondage. For by strength of the hand the Most High brought you out 
from this place. There shall no loving bread be eaten. Read it one more time. Cut on cut. There shall no loving bread be eaten. Read it again from the top. Cut on cut. And Moses said unto the people, Remember this day in which he came out from Egypt. So what are we doing? We're remembering the day we came out from Egypt. The Lord doesn't want you for, to forget so you can think that you're nothing but a slave. All you are is, I'm fine, pass it to the class first. Like, hand me a piece, I'll take some. Give me that little piece right there. Give me that little one right there, right there in that hand. Give me that, ooh wee. This is it right here. This is unleavened bread. You see it's flat. It's flat and flaky. Somebody put some oil or butter in this and something. This looks better than most unleavened bread. This is it, all right? I'll eat a piece right here. Delicious. <laughs> all right. Delicious. Everybody eat some. Nice and flat, flat bread. A corn tortilla would be unleavened bread also. Not a flour tortilla. You cannot eat that, all right? Come on. Is it Dorito or that? Doritos have yeast in them. Doritos. But a plain corn chip. Plain mm -hmm. Tostitos do not have leaven, sis. Oh, oh, oh. Crackers have leaven. Crackers have leaven. Okay, what you have to do is learn to read the ingredients. And this is why. Keep going. Cut on, cut on. Exodus 13, verse 3. And Moses said unto the people, Remember this day. No, not, I need Leviticus, not Exodus. Cut on, cut on. Give me cut the on. laws for the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Cut the on, laws. Cut on. All right, crackers no good because crackers sold right now in the store have leaven. The leaven makes it soft. Without it, it would not preserve. After a week or two, the cracker would be inedible. So it's like a preservative. You understand? So that's why the leaven you, the crackers you buy in the store will have leaven. You have to read the box system. If that's what it says, then it's lawful. But if it says leaven, yeast, baking soda, baking powder, or sodium bicarbonate, it's unlawful for seven days. You understand? Those are all leavening agents, meaning lightening agents, which is where the word leaven comes from. It lightens the bread. It makes it light. What you need is bread that is not light. Bread that is flat and hard. So if you didn't make it yourself, you have to read the ingredients. So if you have the box, read it. That's all you're going to do. You're going to read it and see. That's why I know Tostitos are unleavened. Doritos are leavened. Oh, you understand? Oh. Um, for instance, Kaya, chicken nuggets from McDonald's. Mm -hmm. Chicken nuggets are leavened. You can't eat chicken nuggets because the flour that they put on the chicken has baking soda in it. So you can't eat that. KFC original recipe has baking soda in the flour that they coat it with. So you for seven days, you'll be reading the ingredients as the UPK has been doing since 1969. Reading ingredients to make sure there's no leaven in it. That's if you don't make it yourself. If you make it yourself, then you know what's in it. All right? Leviticus 23, come on. Come on, come on. Leviticus 23, verse 6. And on the 15th day of the same month is the Feast of Unleavened Bread unto the Lord. Seven days he must eat unleavened so bread. Not, so I'm not to Let the brother do it. Now he's back. You got it. Go ahead. Read on. Mm -hmm. Cut on one cut. Seven days ye must eat unleavened bread. So that's step one. The first step is this. You must eat unleavened bread for seven days. Don't go without it. Every day, sometime before that sun goes down, eat as much or as little as you want, but you must eat it. For seven days, we're doing it right now. So if you don't eat any tonight, you did it tonight. So everybody have some, have some in your classes, <coughs> so the students can get some if they don't get any at home. Caught but on, you God. better get some, one way or the other. Caught seven on, days you must eat unleavened bread. Go ahead. Caught on, caught. 
Verse 7, and the first day ye shall have a holy convocation. Ye shall do no sub our work therein. Mm -hmm. Verse 8, but ye shall offer an offering made by fire. Skip down to get all the leaven out of your dwelling. Cut on one cut. You got to find that. That might be in Exodus, but I'm not sure. Cut on one cut. You want a scripture where it says, get all the leaven out of your dwelling. That's something else you have to do. I'll find it also. I'll find it for you, all right? Keep looking. Cut on all the leaven out of your dwelling. If you, if you, when you got it, let me know, all right? Cut on one, cut. Go ahead, up. Um, Exodus chapter 12 and verse 9. Solid. Exodus 12 and 9. Yeah, that's what you need. Solid. Um, 12 and 15. Uh, 12 and 19, sir. Let's start at 12 and 15. Go ahead. Let that mind read since he's closer to the computer. Caught on one cut. We have the um, book of Exodus 12, verse 15. Seven days shall ye eat unleavened bread. Even the first day ye shall put away leaven out of your houses. This is what's important. So the first day, leaven has to be out of your house. So what do I mean by that? Not only must you eat unleavened bread, but you got to go in your house and get all the leaven out of your house. So if you have bread in your house, put that bread in your car, on the porch, in the basement, out back, or throw it away and get it out. But you can have no leaven in your home. You understand? Whatever is your home. So let's say you stay in a studio apartment. Let's say you stay in your mama's house. And your home is your room. Get the leaven out of your room. Put it away from you. So imagine a priest that goes in your house, in your living space, and inspects it for leaven. He is to be able to find no leaven in your living quarters. I don't like that. Whatever that is. Sometimes if you live in a shelter, your living quarter is your, your uh, box. Have no leaven in that box. Have, if you live in your mama's house and she's in the world, your, your living quarter is your room. Get it out. Or if you own the house, the whole house is yours. Put the leaven out on the front porch, in the basement, in the garage, outside, or just throw it away and get new leaven in seven days. Whatever. But you cannot have leaven in your home at all. Everybody understands that? Hold on, hold on. You do that on the first night of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. You had your hand up? Everybody understands that, right? Hold on, hold on. So you, so what are you doing? UPK tradition. You're going through your home, reading the boxes. If it has leaven, put it in a bag, put it outside. Now remember, in seven days, you can eat it. So you might not throw it away. You might just put it outside, bag it up somewhere. You go back in seven days, you can bring it back in the house and eat it. But it cannot be in your house for seven days. What's the spirit of the law? If the priest comes through your home, you don't want him to find leaven in your house. Because if leaven is in your house, then what might that mean, Sharma? Uh, that you've been sneaking and eating leaven. And then he cuts your head off with a sword, something like this, puts you to death. So you get leaven out of your house so you can save your neck. Do you understand? And you do it today to remember what it was like coming out of Egypt. To never forget. I might. God, I want to be on sister. Uh, she had a question. She said, um, is her, uh, baking soda toothpaste unlawful now? Baking soda on toothpaste is lawful because it is not leaven. You cannot raise bread with baking soda toothpaste. If you squirt that baking soda in bread, it will not raise the bread. But if you if you take a loaf of bread and let it get moldy, you can raise bread with old bread. 
Oh, you can no, raise no. bread with old crackers. You and, and old cracker is uh, cracker is unleavened bread. So the baking soda toothpaste you can leave in your house, but a box of baking soda you have got to get out of your house. You understand? Oh, a oh. box of baking soda cannot be in your house for the feast of unleavened bread. A lot of a lot of people have a box of baking soda in the refrigerator. Some of you brush your teeth with baking soda. It might be in the bathroom. Get it out of your house for seven days. They cost 50 cents. You can throw it away or you can just get a new one. All right? Go ahead. Yeah, sure. I have a question. Um, it, it all has to do with the Passover. Like when the Passover day, it's a, um, you know, you're not going to eat no way to eat in it, right? Yes. So, it, do, so that means you can't drink beer? Beer is not a leavening. Mm -hmm. It's not. You can't take beer and raise bread with beer. You can drink beer and you can drink what else? Wow. That's 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 traditional and lawful to drink in the Passover and the feast is wine. You can drink wine. Wine is made with yeast. So you can drink beer, which is made with yeast, and alcohol, which is made with yeast. It is not a leavening agent. It will not raise bread because the wine kills the yeast. You understand? When you make yeast with beer, when you make uh, beer with yeast, the process of making beer kills the yeast. It's dead. The process that they make toothpaste with kills the baking soda. The process they make uh, wine with alcohol with kills the actual yeast that did make the beer. There's no yeast in beer. There's no um, yeast in alcohol and wine. You can't raise bread with it, and that's the same reason that baking soda toothpaste is lawful, because you can't actually raise bread with it. But you can raise bread with baking soda. You can take that baking soda, slap it in some biscuits, and you'll have a light, fluffy biscuit. So get rid of baking soda. But beer, uh, wine, alcohol is lawful. It is not a leavening agent. All right? Something else that is not a leavening agent, though it sounds like it is, yeast extract. You'll see that term in a lot of things. Yeast extract is caramel. That's what yeast extract is. Caramel is sugar water that's burned. They call it yeast extract because it tastes like yeast. It's, it has a um, sour taste or fermented taste, but it is not yeast. It is caramel. When I say caramel, you know what I mean? Brothers, learn how to cook. I got to give you a whole cooking lesson every goddamn year. Cooking is, caramel is this, equal parts sugar and water. That's caramel. You burn that, that's yeast extract because it tastes like yeast. Yeast has a burnt, caramely taste. Sourdough bread. You ever hear that before? Sourdough bread is a bread with caramel in it. You get the point. That's all it is. Come on. Um, um, what do they call a little pack? Sweetness they put in the coffee. Right? Is that um that's that's nothing. That's not yeast. Okay, that's, that's sugar that. substitute. Okay. Is that what you mean? Right. That would be caramel. No. And that's lawful. That's not yeast. That's good to go solid. Yeast extract is lawful. Uh, baking soda toothpaste is lawful. Baking soda, unlawful. You understand? Uh -oh. Baking soda, unlawful. Baking powder, unlawful. Sodium bicarbonate is baking soda. That's the chemical name for baking soda. Sodium bicarbonate, unlawful. Get it out your house. Don't eat anything with sodium bicarbonate, baking soda, baking powder, yeast, leavening agent, leavening, eat nothing with those things in it until Sunday, 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 Sunday night. You had your hand up a card? No. Everybody's with me. Card on my card. You should have did this already. If you haven't, do it tonight. Keep going. Card on my card. And even the first day, ye shall put away leaven 
out of your houses. You get rid of it. Get it out your crib. Get it out your house. Keep going. For whosoever eateth leavened bread from the first day until the seventh day, that soul shall be cut off from Israel. What does that mean when it says that soul shall be cut off from Israel? If a priest comes in your home and finds out you have baking soda, you have yeast, you got a little pack of sourdough you've been saving in your refrigerator. I, I have had sourdough since 98. 1998, I made sourdough to make bread. I keep it in the refrigerator since 1998. How many years is that, Akai? That's a lot of years. Every year, I take that sourdough and I put it outside. I put it in the backyard. I put it in my garage, wherever I'm living at. I, I take it outside. I put some sugar in it so it doesn't die, and I put it outside. In seven days, I bring it back in. I've kept this same sourdough since 1998. And when I make bread with it, shower ma, oh, it's delicious. Did I mention that to you? Let me know. I'll bring you, I'll bake you some bread if you want to get down. I bake some bread with that sourdough, brother, and it's good. But for seven days, it's not in my house. I take it and I put it out. Or whatever wife has it in the crib, she puts it outside the house for seven days. All right? That's what I've always done. That's what you can do. Why? Because if any soul is found to be eating, uh, eating leavened bread, that soul is cut off from his people. Uh, meaning what? You get killed. You get the sword. Now, if you've been living in Galatia, you just can't never come back in the nation again. Because brothers know you've been eating leavened bread during the Feast of Unleavened Bread. So they never want to let you in, which is why the brothers in Jerusalem didn't want to let Timothy in and brothers raised outside of Jerusalem. Now, we know because of Christ, we all have a pathway back in the nation. So even though you've been eating leavened bread your whole life for the Feast of Unleavened Bread, you can always come back in. But keep the spirit of the law. The spirit of the law says that you will be a man or a woman that gets it out your house, that doesn't eat it for seven days, and Christ has died for the time that you were eating it, that you were breaking that commandment. Come on. Come on. So like it, we have on two questions online. If you Let's want. go. Come on, come on. One sister says she is in a marriage, she in her own marriage. What is all the ways for a uh, divorce? This is divorce. If you're a woman, divorce is the day your husband dies. Once the Lord kills him, you're free. Until then, you married in Shalom. Ask her, is her husband in the world? Cut on my cut. And what's the second question? The young brother needed the young breakdown, Ezekiel 44, verse 20. Let's get that. Ezekiel 44 and 20. We're good on unleavened bread. Everybody get that. Now, that unleavened bread was pretty good. Who made that unleavened bread in that refrigerator? That was pretty delicious. Like, uh, you ain't getting none of that. Somebody cooked up some good unleavened bread in there tonight. Go ahead. Officer Knox's mother. Who? Officer? What's his Hebrew name? Knox. Knox. Officer Knox's mother can make some unleavened bread up. That was pretty strong unleavened bread. I've had a lot worse than that. She must have put some butter and oil and olive oil up in that unleavened bread. You who had that? Y'all had that right. That eleven bread was pretty good. Right or wrong, y'all. Uh, Officer Knox mother. Officer Knox mother can make some eleven bread. Go ahead, uh. The old sister said, Con, her own husband. He in the own world, but she in the truth. Her husband is in the world. She's in the truth, and she's just praying for him to die every day. Listen. <laughs> Stop that. All right. Ask her, did she marry her husband? Before she found the truth or after she found the truth? Cut on my cut. Okay, let's get the other brother's question. What did he say? Ezekiel 40, 44? 44 verse 20. Ezekiel 44 and 20. I'm fine for now. I'll pull up. Do you know my Ezekiel 44 and 20. Let's go. Ezekiel chapter 44 verse 20. Neither shall they shave their heads, nor suffer their locks to grow God, old. Give me a second. 
Is that is that the scripture he wants? I don't know what he wanted to be on breakdown on the I'll other explain. Box. Come on. Go ahead, Ark. Neither show they shave their head. Let me get 44 and 18. Ezekiel 44 and 18. When you get the sister's question, let me know. Cut on, cut. Ezekiel chapter 44 and verse 18. They shall have linen, bunnies upon their heads. They shall have linen, breeches upon their loins. Mm -hmm. They shall not gird themselves with anything that causes. What? Let me skip that. Give me the brother's question in specific, Doc, so I can answer it. Come on, come on. He brother. wanted to know the seven locks that was in his own hair, the own locks. In Samson's head? So like or in this scripture? The only one was on Ezekiel 44, verse 20. All right, go ahead, read it, read it. Salaki, read it. that wasn't that on Salaki, the on seven locks and Judges 16 and 19. So did, did he have a question in 44 also? Cut on one, cut on oh, no. Uh, okay, the seven locks in Samson's head, you need a Zondervan Bible Dictionary. Do we have one here tonight? Look it up, Zondervan Bible Dictionary. You might be one over here. Zondervan Bible Dictionary, you want to look it up. The seven locks in Samson's head were seven braids. You got, you have some fake Israelite groups that has brothers cutting their hair, making them look real Christian. -y. I don't respect them, nor does anybody else, because a man's hair is my man is supposed to have hair if the Lord gives him hair. If the Lord doesn't give you hair, that's the Brock will tell you how why y'all was shy. The most I took your hair. Paul talked about that. Paul said, does not nature dictate that if a man have long hair, it is a shame unto him? Meaning, nature will take your hair, not the barber. You understand? Nature will take your hair. Not Tony and them at Shea Magic down on 7th and 10th Street, who's your barber. Nature will take your hair. If nature takes your hair, the Lord took your hair. But if the Lord did not take your hair, then you have hair. Is that simple to understand or not? The Lord gave you hair. Some brothers are very short. No need to wear, you know, big tall boots to make yourself taller. The Lord made you very short. Some brothers the Lord made very tall. No need for you to be ashamed of being tall. Well, some brothers the Lord took your hair. Don't be ashamed of it. The Most High took your hair. The Most High took Isaiah, took um, whose hair was the bald brother, who the, the she-bears came and ate the children who made fun of him. Elijah was a bald-headed prophet. Seven, 40 children came and said, look at you, you bald-headed mother effer. They made fun of Elijah. Three bears came and killed those children. He was a bald-headed man. The Lord took his hair. Other brothers, like Isaiah, were snatched up by an angel by one of their braids and carried into a tall mountain. The Lord gave those brothers hair. Whatever the, if the Lord takes your hair, he took it. If he doesn't, then you got it. Oh. Now we'll read about the seven locks that were in um, Judges. Judges, which is Samson, or uh, what's Samson in Hebrew? Shemaiah. Is that right? I'm going to look it up. Keep going. I want locks in the Bible dictionary. Locks in the Bible dictionary. In reference to the hair of the head, locks renders several different Hebrew words and numbers. The term indicates the unshorn and this. The unshorn and disheveled. Keep going. Locks of the Nazarite. Keep going. Meaning the Nazarite let his hair grow. They were unshorn, meaning uncut. Disheveled, meaning it didn't, you know, it wasn't, you know, cut neat and low. He had a lot of hair, like the young brother's hair in the back, like a lot of brother's hair in the UPK. You, when I first came in the UPK, every brother rocked braids, man, and they still do that today. Right. Still today, because we're biblical. We're biblical based. And these brothers, the Nazarites, rocked their hair, not just them. Keep going. And judges. 
The braided locks. The what? The braided locks. The what? The braided locks. The braided locks. Go ahead. Of the Nazarite. Of the Nazarite. Keep going. Samson. Of who? Samson. Of who? Samson. Samson did not have dreadlocks. Samson had locks, which are braided. That whole term dreadlock comes from locks, which means braids. Dreaded locks are the dirty, disgusting braids that you can only get from being dirty and poor and not having access to a shower. That's why they're called it dreaded locks. People have always had braids. Israelites have had braids since the beginning of time. Dreadlocks came from braids that you get from not having access to good hygiene in slave ships on plantations some of you i've met some brothers that have dreadlocks because their mother was a coke head and a crackhead so they got their hair braided when they were young but their mother never had the good maternal instinct to wash their hair every week so before you know it the boy grows up with having dreadlocks from a baby not because it's supposed to be that way but because your mother didn't wasn't a good mother. If you had a good mother, what would she do? She'd wash that hair every two weeks, every month, clean it, comb it. But when you got a mom that's getting high and alcoholic, she braids your hair one time when you were seven. And that's it. And you grow up having dreadlocks because your mama was too busy chasing penis all over the projects to braid your hair to clean it, to wash it. Now you think having dreadlocks is how you're supposed to be. Samson had braids. What is a, why is a braid called the lock? A lock is that process of locking three strands of hair together. That's a lock. How do you know it's a lock? Because you can do what every two weeks or every month? Unlock it. You can unlock it. But a dreadlock is not a lock because you cannot Unlock it. It's sealed up shut. Why? Dirt, uh, uh, fly vomit, feces, sweat, whatever nasty thing. You ever see somebody with dreadlocks? You cut off one of them dreadlocks and see what crawls out. Right. You listen. Who has dreadlocks by nature? Homeless people. You've seen them all your life. You take a homeless man. You put him living outside. He'll have dreadlocks in a few years, and they get all light colored and thick and stuck together. That is not lawful. You're just a dirty, dirty person with no access to running water. Israelites, we are clean people up. We lock our hair every few weeks or every month or so. You unlock it, clean it, wash it, put some of them good oils in it. All of them Ahoba oils and Jehovah and Retoba. Oils and the wonderful oils. Get a cot of Orion. Get his hair on spin. Let his head, his brother rocking head. Let him see that hair. Let him glory in it, Akkad. Akkad got some UPK hair. I've been seeing that hair for years since I came in the truth. Every brother has had that hair. Is rocking down. I, I assume the women, they don't mind that. Do they, I, I don't think they mind that hair, brother. And they don't need to mind it. They need to like it and love it and want to be the one that gets to maintain it and keep it. Why not? It's how Samson's hair was. Everybody understands that. Oh, no, no, no. That's that's enough on that. That's the braided locks of judges. If that's what he wants, read this scripture real fast. I got to wrap it up. Oh, no, no, no. Come on, sir. Uh, and I'm not in judge. What did he ask for? In Isaiah 40 something. That was on Ezekiel 44 and on. Ezekiel 44 and what? 20. 20. Go ahead. Ezekiel chapter 44 and verse 20. Neither shall they shave their head, nor suffer their locks to grow long. They shall only pull their heads. What's pulling your head? Meaning what? This is the Israelite custom of when your hair gets so long that you cannot go to war, the Israelites would trim their hair. So let's say you are some brother who your hair is so long and so thick 
that you cannot function with it. I'll give you the best example. If you're somebody that's fighting, you can't have hair in your eyes if you're fighting. You're going to have to trim your hair if it gets in the way. That's why the Lord said, you shall not shave it bald. You shall not, what's the other one? Suffer your hair to grow long. Now, what is long hair? Who's the brother that asked the question? Uh, a lot. Y'all believe uh, he inside the world. He not in the truth, sir. Okay, what is long hair, brother in the world? What is long hair? I'll give you a better answer. What does it mean to be tall? A brother in the world, answer the question. What does it mean to be tall? Then give me the scripture where it says, in 1 Corinthians 11, where it says um, it's a shame for a man to have long hair. What does it mean to be tall? Give me that. Any questions off this topic? Like this, sir. Can he speak so I can hear him? So like it, he has to type it up. Come on. What did he say? Uh, he ain't on responding yet. All right, I got to move on. All right, brother in the world, type in your answer. If you're wondering whether or not you can have that old shaved head that you have in that fake Israelite group, you can't. You can't do that. Those fake Israelites are trying to emasculate you up, trying to make you something suitable for your supervisor, which is what Christians do. Christians have a doctrine to make you more acceptable for your supervisor at work. That's why, what is the holy clothing of the Christian church? What's their religious attire? Who can answer? What do they wear in church on Sunday? Officer. Suits and tie. What, do, what does your supervisor consider appropriate clothing when you come to work? Officer. Suits and ties. Because your religious leaders are set up by the white man to create a person in you that is a more perfect slave. That's why they want you to shave your face, wear a suit and a tie on religious services so that every Sunday you are training for work on Monday. So every Sunday, what are you doing? Shaving your face, putting on a suit and tie, doing what your wife tells you to do so that you're ready on Monday to go to work. That's not what God wants out of you. God wants you to take over the world, not to be a better slave. Keep your beard. When the Lord said, um, wear your hair long, what is long? What does that mean? What is tall? What is tall? Is six foot two tall? Is that tall? Not if you're six foot five. It's six foot five tall. Captain Tazariak is six foot five. What would they call him in the NBA? He'd be a guard because he wouldn't be what? Because he wouldn't be? Wouldn't be tall. Tall is relative. You understand? What is 5'11 in China? Tall. You 5'11 in China, they go, oh my God, look how big you are. What's 5'11 in Mexico? Tall. Tall is relative. Tall is not a certain height. Tall is relative to who you're talking to. Some brother who you think is tall, another people thinks is short. If you're 6'3", that's tall. Not if you're in the NBA, that's a guard. That's a point guard. That's a short point guard in the NBA. In the NFL, it's like well, you ain't really tall enough to, to get down and hit. You get my point? Tall is relative. Long hair is relative. What is long? Long is relative to you. Long is what you consider long. What do you consider long? Hair that is too much for you. Hair that is in your boots. Hair that is in your eyes. Hair that is like, oh, I can't, I can't handle all this hair. I got to get rid of some of it. Don't bald it. What should you do? Pole it. Look up polling in your Bible dictionary. Someone else grab it. Polling, I'll give it to you for time's sake. Polling is trimming your hair. Trimming. 
You trim your hair until it is comfortable for you. But you better not ball it, ball your hair. You trim it until it's like, I can handle this much hair. Akai, your hair is down to about your chest. Can you handle it? Then it's not long. Everybody understands? If you can handle it, it's comfortable for you. It's relative. You wouldn't consider your hair long. You consider your hair comfortable for you. But if your hair was in your boots, if you were tripping over it when you were walking, you might do what? Pull your hair. You trim your hair. Long and short are relative terms. They're like big and tall or short and or, or wide and skinny. Some brother, you say he's skinny. Another culture will say, nah, he's big. That's what long, tall, and long, and short, and all those things, those are relative. When Give me 1 Corinthians 11 and 3. Go ahead. Please, please. 1 Corinthians 11 and 14. Mm -hmm. Doth not even nature itself. This is Paul. Paul said, doth not nature itself. What is nature, Rock? The Lord. Nature is not the barbershop. Nature is what the Lord does on its own. Who wanted you to be the height you are? How tall are you, brother? 6'1". Six, one. Six, one. Who wanted you to be that height? The most high. Can you be 5'11"? No. Can you be 6'2"? No. You were made 6'1", which way? So, naturally. naturally. Well, how do you know what's your natural hair length? Same brother. No. Yeah. How do you know what your natural height is? Christ. What? How tall are you? Six one. How do you know what is your natural height? Six one. Is your natural height five eleven? Is your natural height five four? How do you know your natural height is not five four and it's six one? How do you know the natural length of your hair? Shalom. If you don't cut it, that's the natural length of your hair. Making your hair shorter is like making yourself 5'4". You can walk on your knees if you want, I guess, or stoop down, but it won't be natural. You're naturally 6'1". That's your height. You can't make it taller. You can't make it shorter. It's who you are. It's your height. You get my point. You're born that way. Well, there is a natural length to your hair. Some brothers, it will be on your chest. Some brothers, it's going to go to your ears and never go an inch past it. Some brothers, you're going to get to a certain length of your hair, and it will never grow. It will stay there for 15, 20 years. It'll stop right about here, about your ear and it won't grow anymore. That length is your what? Natural length. Read again, Akai. I mean, I'm not. Kind of my kind. First Corinthians 11, verse 14. Do if not even nature itself teach you that if a man have long hair, it is a shame unto him. How does nature teach a man that if he hath long hair, it's a shame? Nature doesn't want you to have long hair. How do you know? Because uh, when your hair grows and it stops at a certain length and it doesn't grow anymore. Because a man's hair stops growing. And what happens around about 40 years old? 45 years old. He uncovers the crown of that hair. Huh. Everybody, say, I hope you don't uh, find out. But for one out of every two brothers, the exact part that you have uncovered right here, he's taking that hair from you. Round about 40 is going to start happening for one out of two of you. Not for General Johanna. <laughs> General Johanna, hey, just keep growing no matter how old he gets. But for some brothers, the Lord takes this part of your hair, the exact part that you uncover when you wear a headpiece. He uncovers the crown of your head. They call it today male pattern baldness. Nature takes a man's hair, naturally. 
It's what's supposed to happen. You're supposed to have hair until he takes it. He takes it from right on top, from the crown of your head, from the exact space that you have uncovered in a headpiece. George Jefferson. He takes it from right on top. That's nature. If you didn't do anything to make it happen, you can't do nothing to stop it. It's not because of the barber. You didn't do it. He did it. The Most High did it. And it's natural, just like your height. It's natural. Keep going. God, I want God. Verse 15. But if a woman has long hair, it is a glory to her. Doesn't nature tell you if a woman has long hair, it's glorious? How do you know? Because there is no such thing as female pattern baldness. A woman can grow her hair to her feet if she's 70, if she's 80. Any woman that has a bald head, it's a curse from God. It is not natural. That's why you can buy products online, buy things. Command and General Johanna gives some sisters a whole program of things they can do and buy to grow their hair. The first thing you better do is watch your mouth. That's right. That's step one if you a woman and want to grow your hair. Come on, brother. You better believe it. That's the precept. A, a, the Lord is going to take your hair if you are a haughty and disrespectful woman. He's going to make baldness upon that head because of your spirit. Since you want to act like a man, you're going to look like one too. God, that's right. He's going to take that hair from you. So now you'll be George Jefferson. And you got a ton of women around here looking like goddamn George Jefferson up under a nation of weave. A nation of weave. You take that weave off, you're going to think George Jefferson is standing right in front of you. Where we at? Go ahead. Three and 16, is that right? Read that quickly, somebody. Any more questions online? Akai, I, I think I'm this is the one I want, not 11 and 3. So, look, I'm on. Come on, come on. Your brother said, Can you eat pasta? Yes, pasta is unleavened bread. Pasta is flour and water. You can eat spaghetti, macaroni, uh, all of those pastas. Pastas are not leavened, they are flour and water. Pasta is unleavened bread. Come on. Cut on my cunt. Then on the sister side, she married after she came inside the truth. Okay, well, what you've done is a mistake that you have to deal with and love your husband through that mistake. If you're a woman, we have a one year rule in the school, right? We have a one year rule. You come into the school, you obey that one year rule, the most high will give you a man in the truth who will be a man bound to you, who is a man sub submissive to the law of the most high. Now, some sisters I've found, your vagina won't let you wait. You go give that vagina to Rashi on the block. Well, guess what? Rashi is not observant to the law, but you are. So Rashi is your husband until he dies. Don't go kill Rashi. Don't plot to kill Rashi. Rashi is your husband, and you have made a commitment to him. I'll tell you what it's just like. It's just like having a child that you didn't plan for. Some of you have gotten women pregnant. You didn't want to get them pregnant. You thought you was not going to have a baby. You thought you could just knock that woman off, have sex with her, and roll. But she got pregnant. Well, what do you do? Throw away the child? No. Nah. Honor the commitment that you made. Right. You had sex with her. The baby is yours. And you take care of that child. That's what a woman must do with a husband who she has that she would not have married if she had had enough strength to wait. You understand? If you're a woman and you had sex with Rashid or Kimmy or the brothers around on the corner or some old Jake in the world, that's your husband, man. You better love him till the day he dies. Right. You love him. You take care of him. You make his sandwiches and comfort him and have sex with him even though he's in the world. We don't do that in the UPK, man. We don't treat our brothers in the world unlawfully. Right. If you marry a man in the world, then you better honor that man in the world. 
You better stay in the truth. Now, if your husband tells you to stop coming to the class, say, my Lord, I must go to class right. because I cannot sin at your order. If he says, baby, I want you to smoke this weed with me. Say, my Lord, I cannot smoke weed with you because I cannot sin at your order. Baby, I want you to eat pork, eat shrimp, have a threesome with me. My Lord, I cannot do that because I cannot sin at your order. You tell him that, but you treat him with respect because you open your legs to him, even though General Johanna told you to wait a year. You couldn't wait, right? Then that's your man. Honor what you've done. Honor your commitment. Who do I bring up? You bring up the sister Abigail, who was married to a brother in the world. And that brother in the world was a simple, stupid fool. But she saved her husband's life when David was trying to kill her husband because of her husband's foolishness. She saved her man's life. And she was bound to her man until he died. Give me um, 1 Corinthians 7 if you are bound to a, the unbelieving and they depart. I don't want to talk. Now, I'm going to give you the scenario, the only scenario that frees a woman if she marries a man in the world before he dies. And I'm, I'm telling you out of love, if you have a husband in the world, a brother in the truth is not going to marry you or else he'll be kicked out of school. I'm telling you as fat as I can. If General Johanna finds out that you got you some sister in the UPK wearing a dress and your head is covered, but there's some poor Jake who you are cheating on, what? he's going to kick you out the truth and the brother in the truth that had sex with you. He's kicking both of y'all out the school because our reputation has been forged over many years. And we ain't ready to lose it for you. You better treat that brother in the world with respect and love. Praying that one day, because of your virtue, he comes in the truth. That's in 1 Peter, the third chapter. We'll finish with those two scriptures. Give me 1 Peter 3 and 1 first. 1 Peter is by the righteous conversation of the wives. If you married a brother in the, in the world after you found the truth, that's because you were so dumb and lustful that you couldn't wait a year. Ain't no crying about it now. Honor your commitment. You must have loved that brother. You gave him your vagina. Thought I thought. Would you have sex with him for if you don't love it? You must have thought he was handsome. You must have thought he had nice new Nike sneakers or a nice new car. You love him then. Be with him. Stay with him. Laugh and talk with him and be with him. He's your husband and you are bound to him forever. Who else do I tell the same thing to? A lot of brothers, you go out there and have sex with some woman who is undignified, uneducated, and unhonorable. But you don't want to wait for her to come into the school. So what do you tell her? You meet the broad on the internet on Facebook. And what do you tell her? Uh, sister, don't go into the class because I don't want to wait a year for you. I'll teach you myself because if you go into the classes, then I can't be with you for a year. So I'll teach you myself. No sweat. You did that? Well, once you have sex with her, she's yours. She, You got her. And when she goes to the club every weekend, dressed like Apollonia and Vanity in the Prince video, that's your wife, huh? She's yours. Don't call me crying about her. And, oh, what did I do? What did I do? That's your wife, Doc. Teach her. Help her to not wear them breasts where they sit up tall on a shelf with that old thing on they like to wear, serving them breasts up to everybody in the nightclub every weekend. You mad because she wearing tights. Negro, that's why you broke the one-year rule to get her. That's why you pulled her out of the classes to have her. Because you couldn't wait because them breasts were stacked up like two melons sitting up on a shelf. Well, now those melons is yours. Well, you got them. You, they're yours now. That's your wife. Deal with it. Handle it. Right? I tell the same thing to women. Give me First Peter's 3 and whatever. Skip down. I got to go. Come on. 
So like I have the Jesus one in front yeah, so. For, no, hold that. Give me the one in First Peter's first. That they be won by the righteous conversation of the wise. If you're a woman and your husband is in the world, have righteous conversation with him. Meaning what? Don't talk about him. Don't say, nigga, you ain't nothing. All you do is eat pork. All you do is eat shrimp. A lot of you wicked broads, you go home and make your husband feel bad because he's not a brother in the school. You'll say, I'm just gonna talk to the brothers in the school. That you ain't nothing. The brothers in the school, they do this. The brothers don't do that because we are gonna call that man and we are gonna tell him we stand with him. That's right. what we are gonna say. We are gonna say your brother, your man is smoking weed, eating pork and eating shrimp. We on his side. Now you go home and be little that man. We're not allowing a sister in the school to belittle some poor brother in the world. Right. No, no. You married him, you knew about the one year rule, and you still married him, then you right. treat him like your king then. That's right. You treat him like your king, though he eats pork, eats shrimp, and smokes weed. And you never touch his weed, and never touch his pork, and never touch his shrimp, but you don't disrespect him. Right. Now, this is what you can do. I'm, I'm on. Come on, come on. First Peter 3, verse 1. Likewise, ye wives, be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word. If you have a husband that obeys not the word, he's in the world. Go ahead. That's also, Salakia, they also may be one. Your husband can come into the truth, man. You got a wife, you got a husband in the world, he can come into the truth. He can change. He may be one, go ahead. May without the word be one. He may be one without the word, go ahead. By the conversation of the wives. By the conversation of the wives, S on the end, because a man can have more than one wife. Everybody understands? Talk, talk, talk. So what are you going to do? You're going to go home, your husband smokes weed, he gets high, he eats pork. Don't go home and say, you no good nigga. I wish I never married you. I wish I married Shah Amath. Shah Amath no more than you. Don't do that. Because Shah Amath gonna tell your man, he stands with him, not you. Don't do that. You have righteous conversation. My Lord, I can't eat pork with you. I can't eat shrimp with you because I have learned that you are my king and I love you so much. Now, what might that man do? He might go, damn, I'm in the world, but whatever they teaching you in that UPK is amazing. I'm coming down to that school next week. I'm coming there, man. I'm getting down there. You, you'll be surprised, man. A sister can provoke you to come to class. You look at your wife and you'll see she all in a long dress talking to you like you're a king, even though you don't have any self-respect. You look at your wife and see she's respecting you more than you respect yourself. You'll come down to class, man. You'll win your husband like that. Right. And you can win him without berating him, without belittling him. The UPK, you, you got to join the fake Israelite group if you want to belittle your husband. Right. They do that. Them old purple faggots, they belittle they wives. They belittle they men. They teach a, a man to be belittled and berated and, and made to be small. Not in here, man. Because General Yohanan knows that he found all of us in worse shape. That's right. So your man is in horrible shape. That's how we all work. And we can be one. We can be delivered. If you're a woman and your man is in the world, respect him so much that he wants to join you in the faith that you're in. Everybody understands that. Oh, oh, oh. Now, give me now. Here we are. You're in a scenario where your man hates the truth. He can't stand it. You married him, but he hates the truth, and you are completely being righteous towards your husband, though he's in the world. 1 Corinthians 7. Oh, 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 oh. You have it. Oh, 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 oh. 1 Corinthians 7 and 14. For the unbeliever husband is sanctified by the wife. If you have a wife that's unbelieving, don't worry about that because she, I'm sorry, I'm starting the, the reverse. The unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife. 
That's for the sister. She has an unbelieving husband. Well, guess what? Her husband can be made clean by her because of her. She cleans her husband. The Lord will protect her and protect the entire house because of the sister who's in the truth. Keep going. Cut on my cut. And the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband. And if you're a brother who has married a woman in the world, though she's no damn good, she can still be saved because of you. Keep going. Else were your children unclean, but now are Stop. they holy. But if the Lord didn't do that, then the children would be unclean because their mother is a sinner right. or their father is a sinner. But the Lord cleanses both of you to raise up righteous children, even though one of you is unclean. Right. One of you is a sinner. Keep going. Verse 15. But if the unbelieving depart. Here we go. But if the unbelieving depart, let's say you're a woman in the truth. You've obeyed the UPK's doctrine concerning your husband, though he's in the world. If your husband says, you know what? I can't be with a woman who doesn't get hot. I can't be with a woman who doesn't eat pork. And I hate them brothers. <laughs> what? A sister called me one time and said her husband had a dream. Her husband was a horrible drug addict. And he had a dream one night that he went to go over her house and 10 gorillas came outside and beat him up. And he knew it was those gorillas was where the UPK and he left her. He left the woman because he was horrified of those gorillas right. getting him. You understand? God, he left God. the sister. If your husband leaves you and you are in the truth, and you've done everything that we teach you to do. Go ahead. Let him depart. What? Let him depart. Read again. Let him depart. If your husband leaves you, let him go. Let him go. If you're a married woman to a man in the world and he leaves you, let him go. Go ahead. A brother or a sister. A brother what? Or a sister. A brother what? Or a sister. A brother or a sister. Go ahead. It's not a no bondage in such cases. Ezekiel, um, 1 Corinthians, Romans 7 and 1 says that a woman is under the bondage of her husband uh, as long as he liveth. Paul said, if your husband leave you, a brother or a sister is not under bondage in these cases. If your man in the world leaves you, then you're free to marry a brother in the truth. Now, there's a process, however. The UPK will be calling your husband. Right. We're going to call him. We're going to say, brother, this sister is saying she's free to marry, but we will not let her marry anyone unless you say that you don't want her and you are throwing her away. If that brother says, no, nah, I do want her, I love her, but she made me feel like garbage every right. night and talked about me, then right. you're not marrying anybody in here. That's your husband. But if that brother says, yeah, F that B. I don't want her and I can't stand none of y'all. She free. I don't want nothing to do with her. We'll say, all right, brother. She gonna marry somebody else. F her. You're free to marry another man. But we will be calling your husband right. to verify what you say. And if he verifies that he left you, then you can go ahead and marry one of these kings up in here. Other than that, you're bound to him until you're dead, until he's dead. And I would advise you to make the best of it yeah, because the Lord might bring that man in the truth. Right. He can do it. The Lord might bring your woman in the truth who's not in the truth. Akim, we got to forego the prayers tonight. Hold we'll on. stand up and do one, one salute. Any questions online I haven't dealt with? Dealt with? Live, sorry, that's it. Okay, with that, that's the end of the class. Rock it that hall while you always shy. Give the Lord a hand. With that, tune in next week to the uh, uh, scripture breakdown class, mandatory class. Shalom. Ooh, we want no cowards in our camp, in our camp.